If you've got your Bible with you, turn to Psalm 62. Uh, we're going to read verses 8 through 11 of Psalm 62. But we'll be looking at some other things also. And again, this is the first part of a two-part little mini-series on the power paradox. Uh, tonight, we're kind of asking the question, who's really in charge? Who's in control? Them, meaning those who would come against us, or the Lord. Hopefully, we can find that out uh, tonight. Psalm 62, we're going to pick up the reading in verse 8. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Surely men of low degree are vanity. Men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression. Become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. God hath spoken once. Twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. And also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for you render to every man according to his work. Um, I may have mentioned probably just to some individuals, but uh, a week before uh, the last of the month, 23rd, I guess it was, Sunday, I had an extremely bizarre Saturday night. Forgive the personal reference, but I'm saying this to hopefully encourage all of us here those who might hear this somewhere down the line. Um, I was up basically all night and uh, several severe, I guess they were bona fide panic attacks, stuff I hadn't had since I was in college. And uh, it got so bad that I just said to myself, there's no way I can, I can go to church, let alone minister. And um, I just was watching the clock getting closer and closer <laughs> to leaving time and uh, prayed, of course, and, and others were praying for me. And I finally, I just couldn't even pray anymore. So I just sit in my chair downstairs with a cat on my lap. And I said, Lord, that's it. You know, I just, I can't see it. I can't see being able to do it. And I just said, it's, it's, that's it. I'm done. And I just got real quiet. And it was almost like a feather, very light touch, something on the top of my cranium. And it just went through me. And I didn't feel great, but I no longer felt horrible. And Barb came down the stairs. I didn't think she was going to go because I had kept her up a little bit. And she said, uh, I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm going to church. I said, wow, you're, you're going after missing sleep. And uh, I was thinking about it. I said, hey, wh would you, what would you think about driving me? Because I didn't think I'd be okay to drive. It's almost like being drunk, they say, if you're without sleep severely, which I was. So she said, yeah, I'll, drop, I'll, I'll drive you. And those of you that were here on the 23rd. Solomon got hit by a Holy Ghost bomb and everybody and their brothers tell me what a great service it was. You know, I'm thinking, wow, how do you explain that? How do you explain that? More Sunday. But that's what I call the power paradox. The power paradox. In other words, uh, we can seem like it's the end in the natural. We've come to the end of our strength. For example, we might even be too tired to pray. And yet, as we see here, if we wait on the Lord, as Isaiah says, we can exchange our strength. We wind up mounting up as eagles. We can run and not be weary. For us, running the run of, the run of faith. And we can, we can run and not be weary. We can walk and not faint. Right? You believe that? And more on that on Sunday. Tonight we're looking at it slightly differently. But again, we're contrasting who's really got the power. Now, I want you to notice two things about these verses, Psalm 62. Read the whole thing, but we're looking at verses 8 through 11. And you'll find that two, two concepts come out here very clearly. And they're very, um, they're very apropos to your life and mine. In other words, this is not one of those teachings or doctrines that's up in outer space someplace. But this is something that you and I deal with every day. The first concept is trust. That's our part toward the Lord, hopefully. The second is the idea of trial or difficulty or being in a tight place, or as the psalmist says, having an enemy, whether it's an outward enemy like a, a, an unbeliever or Satan and his crowd of little minions, or whether it's an inner en enemy like our own flesh that is sometimes worse than, than the outer enemy. Trust and trial. And so we want to look at these. First, the concept of trust. I got to tell you that according to many Bible scholars, 
this psalm, verse, uh, Psalm 62, is actually part two of a two-parter. The first part is Psalm, is psalm 61, and it's a revelation given to a guy by the name of Jeduthun, we would say in English. Um, his other name is Ethan, if you study this out. And uh, he was a psalmist, a praiser, appointed by David. Um, his name actually translates to the idea of confession. And as a matter of fact, he was actually commissioned by David to confess or vocally express praise to Yahweh. In other words, it's okay to think about the Lord in our heart and to thank Him in our heart. But this is something that he was ordained by David to do publicly. And even his name has that concept of confessing. Uh, uh, two other psalms are written by him. Psalm 38, Psalm 76, and they all contain this idea of a vow of praise to God, public confession of trust to God and praise for his provision. Now, the other thing I want to mention is, uh, like with many of the Psalms, you can look at Psalm 61, 62 as Israel, as a nation speaking to Yahweh about their enemies, other nations, or you can think of it as an individual Hebrew believer, or in our case, a Christian, uh, appealing to God, trusting in God in the, in the light of our enemies. And again, it could be our flesh, it could be an unbelieving spouse or child or parent or co-worker or boss, you name it, the possibilities are endless. But the idea is, what do we do about the trial? That's why we're beginning with the important thing, trust. And this is a choice that you and I have to make. This is the power paradox. Uh, really getting real with God, with ourselves, even in the eyes of our enemies, whoever they might be, and taking the mask off, as one preacher says, and facing things as they are. What are we going to do about that person, that circumstance, that trial, that tight place that we find ourselves in? Are we going to look to ourselves? Or as we'll see in this psalm, we're going to look to somebody else for help, even maybe an ungodly person, or are we going to trust God? That's a choice all of us have to make. No one can force us. Amen. How many are glad we have that choice? Yeah. It might be difficult what we're facing, but the, the good thing is we have a choice how we're going to handle things. Now, if you look closely again at the whole psalm, I encourage you to read the other verses we didn't, you find there's an alternating between these two concepts of trust and trial, confidence in God and the enemy. The concept of trust appears three different times. We're encouraged by this psalmist to trust Yahweh, and then we have the enemy or the difficulty twice. So it's kind of an alternating trust, trial, trust, trial. And the trust wins three times. Aren't you glad? Let's look at our first text now. Trust in him, Yahweh. Trust in him at all times, you nation. Pour out your heart before him. Why? Elohim, and then no verb, kind of for emphasis. Elohim, the triune God, a refuge for us. I, I like this in the Greek version, the 70, the one that Jesus and the early church used. It has here for nation, synagogue. Synagogue. Trust in him at all times, you gathering of the people. How many have heard the word synagogue? Yeah, it's a fascinating deal because, for example, in the New Testament, we have this concept of synagogue used as a verb. In Matthew 24, Jesus, uh, talking about his return, says, after the tribulation of those days, uh, there will be, you know, the, the, the coming of the Lord with the, the angels and the sound of the trumpet, and he will synaxusin. He will synagogue his people, his elect, from one end of the earth to the other. He will gather together. Paul uses the same word as a noun when he says, now concerning the coming of the Lord, the parousia, the coming and personal presence of the Lord, even our synagogues, our gathering together unto him. And then he talks about how that's going to happen. I love this. The, the Greek version actually uses that word synagogue for nation. What's the word trust mean? It's a Hebrew word that simply means to confide in, to rely on, kind of like your faith in the pew tonight. I don't notice anybody straining their arms hanging on for fear something may happen to that seat. You trust it, yes? 
And so that's natural faith. This is a supernatural faith that is not towards the pew, but toward Yahweh. Again, I like uh, what the, the 70 has, hope in him at all times. Hope in him. And that's not your hope, my hope. I've mentioned this before. Many people have a hope of going to the Cayman Islands when they retire, you know, or Florida, you know. My family physician from when I was a little boy was going to go to Florida, and he did for one year. For one year. That's all he lived after his retirement. But Bible hope is not maybe, yes, maybe no. Bible hope is a confident expectation. Look toward Yahweh, you gathering of the people. Hope, be confidently expecting deliverance from the Lord. And then you notice it says, pour out your heart. Again, the, the Greek version has a word that is the identical word used of the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. How do you and I know when we're really trusting God? When we hold nothing back. When we hold nothing back. Again, when we get into his presence, take the mask off, take off the religious formality, you know, and tell him it like it really is. You know what, Lord, I know in my head your word says this, but you know what, in my heart, I don't have any faith for this. Or, I know you said you'd never, ever, ever leave me or forsake me, but you know what, Lord, I feel like you're a million miles away. I mean, pouring out every last little drop of anxiety and apprehension and fear and all the other negatives, anger, envy, uh, grudge, holding, whatever. Really unloading, just like the Holy Spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost on Cornelius' household. Why would we do that toward the Lord? Because he is our refuge. That answers to the secret place of the Most High in Psalm 91. God is our secret place. David calls him his high tower. The, uh, the name of Yahweh, meaning the character, the person of the Lord, is a high tower. The righteous person does what? Runs into it and is safe. I think about a a watchtower, you know, or a lighthouse in the middle of a dark night. You know, the, the ships below uh, that aren't, aren't within the light might feel like it's the end and it's darkness. But what if you're up there in the lighthouse? It's great. You might be having a ham sandwich or something, you know, a Starbucks coffee or whatever. There's no, no worries, no hassles because you're safe. You can look down on the storm. You can look down on the troubled water, but you're safe. Just like watching a football game. Everybody down on the field getting, you know, kicked six ways from Sunday, but you're up in the box seats, you know. <laughs> you're having a great time because you've got a rich friend that has that seating. And that's kind of what it's like when you and I do what the psalmist is, subject, is, sub, is suggesting here. Hope in him. And again, the 70 says, uh, for, for, for refuge, it has the word voithos imun. He is a helper to us. That's a beautiful word. Voithos means a guy or gal or someone of means that hears someone crying out for help. Like Peter walking on the water and beginning to sink. Lord, so son may save me right now. And Jesus became his voithos. Peter didn't, uh, you know, kind of sugarcoat it, candy coat it. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good, Lord, but I could use just a little hip. He was from Kentucky. Did you know that, Peter? Hit me. No, he didn't sugarcoat it. He was, he, man, he yelled, save me right now. And that's what Voithus is. Someone that will hear your cry, run to your side to assist and to relieve you. How cool is that? That's what God is to us. And uh, then the word selah is inserted. Most scholars I have read uh, feel like that kind of means to pause and Think about this. Pause and think about it. Pour out your heart, not just your head, your heart to him. For he is our hope. Be confident in him because he is our secret place, our high tower. He is the one that hears us cry and runs to our aid to assist and to relieve us. Isn't that beautiful? 
Why do we need that kind of trust? Because of the trials we face. Because of the enemy or enemies, plural. Now let's continue. We're in Psalm 62, verses 8 through 11. Surely or only, in other words, this is the attribute of man. And there are actually two words here. Sons of Adam, which is just natural man, are vanity, which means a breath. You know, the person that says, I'm the big I, all the rest of you are little you's, that's in his own mind, according to the scripture. God doesn't see big eyes and little U's. So he's got two classes of people here. Surely sons of Adam are vanity and sons of, another word, great men are a lie. You getting this? This is the way we sometimes, unfortunately, look at Satan. I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. Peter says he goes about as a roaring lion looking for someone to swallow up whole. And that's true, but if we what? Submit ourselves to God. If we remain steadfast in faith. If we keep our trust, not in ourselves or in some human person, but in Yahweh, if our confident expectation is he's going to hear our cry, run to our side and assist and relieve us, then the devil will do what, according to the scripture? Flee in terror. And I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. It's the same phrase that's used in the Old Covenant of someone who murders someone else without premeditation and is given a city of refuge to run to. How many remember that from the Old Covenant? There were six at one, one time. I almost taught on that one night. If you look at them on the, on the map, they make a cross. All six of those cities of refuge, they make a cross. There goes that wench they matches. Anyway, but... The, the manslayer, do you think he just kind of ambled there after he killed somebody by accident? Man, he was 90 to nothing. Boom, he was out of dodge. That's the same concept. When you and I submit ourselves to God, resist the enemy by faith, he flees in terror. That's why, in a sense, all of his taunts and all of his accusations and all of his threatenings amount to nothing. There, he's like a breath. He's a lie. To be laid in the balance as they are, and this word is actually emphatic in the text, together, nothing. The average Joe Schmo that causes you and me trouble, the big shot that has a law case against us, whoever, neither one is different than the other in the eyes of God. You put them both together and all together, little guy, Big guy, that'll amount to anything. But it doesn't seem like that when, they're, when we're in the middle of it, does it? Anybody ever had a panic attack? Oh, those are fun. <laughs> those are fun. I thought I had a couple of really good ones on the 23rd, you know, until I talk to somebody that sometimes can't leave the house. And I, I almost, you know, I almost broke into tears. I, had, I thought, no, wait a minute, you're the pastor. You know, so, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm thinking, oh, wow. I thought I had it tough, you know, and some folks, when, when it's really on them, they, they can't even leave the house and some people can't drive and whatnot. Anyway, it seems so real, doesn't it, when we're in the middle of it. But the good news is nothing very, very good or very, very bad lasts for very, very long. And I think if we can meditate on this, as the psalmist says, pause, think about this, and believe God's word, choose to believe God's word, these taunts are actually empty. They're empty. The enemy is a paper tiger. He's a lion with no teeth. And it's not that we're so strong. It's that he's so weak. The psalmist goes on here. Look at it with me. Stop trusting in oppression. In other words, stop trying to return tit for tat. Stop trusting in oppression and stop becoming vain in robbery. How many of you know people that have gotten into trouble by cooking the books or doing something illegal because they were between the rock and the hard place? Were they trusting in Yahweh to get them out? No, they were finagling. And I'm not being critical. That's the human condition. Apart from God, what else do we have? If your outgo is greater than your income, what shall be the outcome? Your upcome, upkeep becomes your downfall, yes? But this is, this is this, um, that's what I'm saying. This is not one of those up in heaven messages tonight. 
Stop trusting in oppression. Stop becoming vain and robbery. If riches are increasing, the idea is illegally, don't be setting your heart on them. Why? Why? Because they can disappear. Solomon, the richest man ever lived, said, why are you setting your heart on riches? They can sprout wings and fly away. Here today, gone tomorrow. In other words, don't trust that. Don't let that be your high tower. It's got a leaky roof and the foundation's rotted. Don't, don't let that be your lighthouse. Someone may pull the plug and you'll be in as, dark, as much darkness as that boat he were looking at from up there. Well, think about this in terms of Israel. Again, look at the psalm as Israel speaking as a nation or as an individual believer. Think about Egypt. Uh, I'm sorry, Israel. How many times did they get in trouble, kings of, of Israel, by having an alliance with a foreign power? An ungodly alliance with Syria or Assyria or Moab or whatever. Always went south for them. You know, I'm between a rock and a hard place. What am I going to do? And the king would say, I know what I'll do. I'll go over here to Egypt and see if Egypt will come with me against Syria. Against, you know, and they always lost out. I think about uh, many Christians today. Um, again, you, it's where we live, many of us, in the financial area. How many of you know Christians that have really got into trouble, uh, many times through no fault of their own, and you know, they, they've got to do something about their financial situation. And so they wind up with a l l quick cash loan, you know, and the interest is only 29.999%, you know, for the rest of your life. You borrow 600 and you, <laughs> you return 6,000, you know, <laughs> make the minimum. But I mean, in a sense, how, you guys are, you look like you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, it's the same idea. We have to reach out, we think, in the flesh for something to kind of, you know. I mean, God can use anything, but I'm just making the point. Um, ungodly people will take advantage of believers, just like they will their fellow non-believer, uh, especially when it comes to money matters. And so it's so important, again, in the, in the presence of a trial or a tight place, whether it's money or or, or health, or relationship, or whatever. It's, it's important who we trust. Um, who's really got the power? Who really has the control? Is it the circumstance, or is it God? Is it Satan, or is it the Lord? Who are we trusting in? Someone else, or ourselves, more on that Sunday, or are we looking to the Lord? Thank God we get to choose, amen? Now, here it is. Here's the power paradox. Elohim. You can look at that as uh, uh, what's called, what's known as a plural of majesty. It's plural, meaning this is an important person uh, that's used in Isaiah 53, where it's said of Jesus, he made his, uh, he made his grave with a rich man in his death. And the, the word death there is plural. And some people that don't really study that out say, see that? He died twice, spiritually and physically. It's not that at all. It's a plural of majesty. In other words, that death was, was great in importance. It was heavy in meaning. It doesn't mean he died two times. Uh, Elohim can be that way, or it can mean three persons in the one God. But it, it, it's this, Elohim, he spoke once. I heard this twice, that strength, no verb, to God. You almost want to put a selah in there again. Pause. Think about that. Doesn't seem like that, does it? When the creditor's calling you. Doesn't seem like that when someone's pointing a gun at you. That happened to one of our members. One of our members, and it's this person that knows martial arts. Somebody stuck a gun in his back. And I think he was running through all the different Ike moves that he had learned, you know, and trying to figure out, because this was not a TV show or a video, this was real life. And, you know, he looked to the Lord. He gave me his testimony. He looked to the Lord. He said, I was thinking about the different ways we learned about disarming somebody. He said, as clear as anything, I, I heard the Spirit of the Lord speak to my heart, run. He said it made no sense at all with a gun on him. He ran and ran, no one fired at him. That may never work again, but that's called trusting in the midst of a trial. And this is someone that knew how to disarm someone, right? And yet, 
he chose to trust in the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord told him something that didn't make any natural sense. But it worked. It may never happen again. See how practical this is. You can ask, ask our member, was that practical listening to God? Yeah, pretty much. I don't know how many blocks he'd run. He stopped, turned around, there was nobody there. He didn't get robbed. He didn't get hurt. He didn't get shot. No one else got shot. He just went on. And I just heard he's got a great job now, too. So that's awesome, isn't it? Yeah, who knows? May not have been any bullets anyway, right? We don't know. God has the strength. Now, I, I notice this again in our Greek version. I, I refer to this because this is, you know, the one that the New Testament used. Here's how this one reads, and it's a little different, and that's why I'm bringing it to us tonight. This, the 70 reads, God has spoken apox once for all. God has spoken apox once for all. I heard two things. How many see the difference? It's not that God told him something twice. The 70 has it, God said one thing once for all, and it was two things. He spoke once for all about two things, not just one. Which is right. They're both right. They both make sense because they're both there. But I kind of like this, and I think I kind of favor this. Um, apparently, whoever these Jewish translators were uh, looked at it this way. And here's how it comes out, looking at it that way. God has spoken once for all, apox. I heard two things, these. And it's a demonstrative pronoun, tafta. You can almost say, in other words, pay attention. These are two important things. And God said it to the psalmist once for all. In other words, you can underline it, circle it, highlight it, take it to the bank. It's actually, apox is the same word Jude uses in the New Testament and in his letter when he tells you and me to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Apox. Very important. Why? Did you know that there are Christian, in quotes, denominations that are still adding things to God's word? New revelations and new decisions and decisions that abrogate previous decisions, you know, and we're the only way to heaven and you better follow us, you know, and here's how it is. Oh, wait a minute. The Lord maketh the mistake. He changed his mind. Here's the way it is now, you know. No, he spoke once for all and he gave us the, the faith once for all. But here's what he said. Strength is of you. Here it's Kratos. The strength is of of God and mercy is of you. You, Lord. If we didn't get anything else tonight, those two facts are probably enough. Where is the real strength? Is it in the hands of our enemy? Is it in the hands of the of this disease or the sickness? Is it in the hands of the moneylender? Is it in the hands of the boss? Is it in the hands of the co-worker that's working behind our back to get us fired? Is it, is it in the hands of a wayward child or a, a fellow employee? Where's the strength? According to the psalmist, he heard this once for all from Yahweh himself. Strength is of the Lord. Also, where does mercy come from? The Lord. I hate to tell you this. Can I tell you a secret? If you wait to get mercy from your fellow man, and you hold your breath, they'll be looking for old blue. <laughs> How many of you understand that? It, 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 everybody needs kindness, but no one has any to give us. Everybody's looking for understanding, but nobody has any. Sad, isn't it? This, this is the power paradox. God has the strength, not our enemies. Can I also add not us? More about that on... Sunday. And you, have you thought about this? We're usually fine with this knowledge that the enemies have no power, but we don't like to think about us not having any power. You going to be here Sunday? I hope so. We'll look at that. Look at it real closely and it'll help you. It's helping me. I'm living this thing. I never preach. No preacher that I know of that's worth his salt ever preaches or teaches anything to anybody else before he preaches it to himself. The power paradox is things are not what they seem. 
sons of Adam and sons of great men, they look powerful. They look like they're the big I, we're the little you. And in actual fact, you put them in the balance together, emphasize, and it's lighter than air. It's not what it looks like. It's smoke and mirrors. Why? Because God has the power and God has the mercy. Again, we're okay with God's grace and mercy being poured out on us, but what about the enemy? What about the troublemaker? Sometimes not so much. Not so much. How about Jonah? Under that withered gourd, you know, watching Nineveh, spared after he said, you know, if you, you dead beats don't repent, God's going to nuke you. He's going to toast you. And they repented. And what happened? Yahweh kept his word. And that nation was spared. That city and the nation was spared about 150 years. And was Jonah happy about it? No. He said, what I tell you? Why do you think I went in the other direction when you said go to Nineveh? Why do you think I hightailed it to Tarshish? I know what you're like. Why, why, why should I waste my time? And you say, well, yeah, that's old covenant. Yeah, I know. But how about James and John in the new covenant? Remember what happened when Jesus was rejected at Samaria? What did James and John say? They must have been quite a pair of bookends, those brothers. What did they say? Hey, Lord, you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them the way Elijah did? And what did Jesus say? Yeah, toast them. You don't know what spirit you're of. The Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to what? Save them. Now, look at what God says about his mercy. For you will pay each one according to his works. You will pay back each one according to his works. What kind of works? That's the question. What kind of works will God reward? Say for us who have enemies, who have difficulties, who have trying circumstances. What kind of works do we need to do so that he will reward us with deliverance? And then what about the person that's causing the problem? What kind of works are they doing that he's going to repay? This is very important. Don't lose me now. Hang in there. Give me a couple of minutes. Will you do that? It'll be worth it. Your lineage will be the judge of that. Are they works of the law? Are they works of tradition, of the elders, of the religious elite, of some denomination? No. The unbeliever, the enemy, the wicked will receive the wages of sin, which is what? Death, eternal separation from God. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin, sinful works, is death. Now, what about the other side? What about our works? This word gets tricky for many of us. This is why many of us are not able to trust Yahweh when bad things happen to us, when we're faced with an adversary or an enemy, whether again it's Satan and his crowd, unbelieving people, circumstances, or even our own flesh. This is where you and I get into trouble because we, we default to religious things and we start uh, kind of tallying things when we're in the middle of it. Now, how can I expect God to reward me with deliverance? What do I have to do to be in the place of Peter? Lord, save me! And have Jesus immediately be a voithos for me to come down and run to my side and relieve me. So, well, I get now. How many times have I gone to church this month? And we go down the col column and tick this. And how many days did I have devotions this month? Did I fast uh, once this month? Am I tithing on the gross or the net? Am I tithing at all? Click. Click, and tick, 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 and we go down the column, right? And usually we wind up with what? Great big question mark. How much is enough? How much is enough? How many works of faith do you and I have to do to qualify for God's deliverance and mercy? Forget about the enemy. We don't want him to have any mercy. But what about us? That's where the problem is. That's, that's where the, the puncture in the faith balloon comes from. We misunderstand. Would you like to know what our work is? Would you? It's the work of faith. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. What's it say? Fast till your pants, pants fall down, all ye people. <laughs> Go to church twice on Sunday, midweek, and any other time you can get it. What does it say? Trust in Him at all times. That's our work. Trust. Our work, quote unquote, is to trust. 
Oh, pastor, that sounds good. You mean all I got to do is admit that I'm a mess, admit that I'm full of faults and failures and foibles, and that qualifies me for a deliverance apart from a lot of good stuff I should be doing and I'm not sure that I am doing? Yes. Oh, pastor, that's great, but that's old covenant. I was nearly home free. Can you help me? Maybe you're from Kentucky. Let's turn to John 6 and we quit. John, I want to help us tonight. Gosh, I hope you re remember this or download it or get a copy of it. What's the work? Let me give you the New Testament. Psalm 62, verse 8. Psalm 62, verse, is it verse 8 or verse 10? I don't have it open in front of me. I lost it. Which one says trust in, look, trust in, 8, yeah, okay. Thanks, Joe. I thought I had it right, but I wasn't sure. Trust, that's the old covenant. Look at the new covenant. John's Gospel, chapter 6. Remember when Jesus said in verse 27, Stop laboring for the meat, the one that perishes, but rather for the one that endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then they said unto him, just like you and I do, What must we be doing in order that we might work ta erga, the works of God? Here it is. You ready for it? Write this one down. Let this be your my pillow tonight. I'm sure that's a lovely guy there in Minnesota. I'm sure he's got a good product, but let this be your pillow, okay? So, John 6, 29. Jesus answering said unto them this. He said, tuto estin. Estin would have been enough. This is. But he adds a demonstrative pronoun. This. This is the work of God. Not what you Jewish folk think it is. Not what you Christians think it is. This is the work of God. What's that, Jesus? That you believe on the one that that one sent. How many can believe in Jesus? That's it. That's it. This, tuto estin, this is the work of God. Ina, in order that, pistesite, that you believe is on, on the one Apestulin, Echinos, that that one sent. I wonder if he pointed when he said that. This is the work of God. It's not ta erga, the works. To ergon, the work. Just one thing. Believe on Jesus whom that one sent. Lord, I believe. That's it. The, the other, another psalm says, you get in trouble, you call upon me, I deliver you, you glorify me. What a deal. What a deal. What short circuits us from having his hand extended like it was to Peter. We misunderstand the works that he pays us for. The sinner gets paid wages of wrongdoing, but the saint is rewarded according to his work of faith, trust, confident expectation that our God's going to deliver us just as we are, apart from any quote-unquote good works that we may or may not be doing. Can I give you one more for the road? I gotta, I'm going to have to somehow put this on my rooftop or, or something. Turn to the book of Romans. Let me give you just one more for your, this will be two pillows. This is pillow number two. I've gone a little bit over time tonight, sorry. I just think this is so important. Romans chapter four and we quit. Romans chapter four, verse four. Look at your neighbor and say four, four. What's this song in four, four? You know, four, four, this is it. Now to him, to the one that is working is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. What's Paul saying? Somebody that gives you 40 hours work for a paycheck, is the paycheck the gift? Look at your neighbor and say four or five. Here's, here's the mind-blowing one. I'm going to say, Selah. Pause and think about this as the psalmist says. But to him that is not working, not trying to obey rules and rituals and rites of religion, 
but to him that is not working, but believing on him that declares in right standing the what? Ungodly, not the godly. That's why some of our denominations wanted to read. The ungodly. His faith is counted for right standing with God. That, my friends, is the gospel. That's good news. That drives religion crazy. And that, that verb, declaring righteous, it's, it's a present participle. You and I, even in our best moments, compared to Jesus, are ungodly. And yet, because we believe, he is constantly declaring us in right standing with him. According to the work of the law? No. According to the work of faith. Simple trust. And that's good news for God's people. Would you believe it? Amen. Any questions tonight? I'm in a good mood now. How about you? I could lick my weight in wildcats. Like that one cowboy left a church service and the pastor said, what do you think? He said, I feel like I could lasso the moon. <laughs> Uh, but isn't this great news? The, yeah, sure.